Well, thanks for joining us and for my banner today. We're discussing the subject of exclusive economic zones and um, it is a sea zone prescribed by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea over which a state has special rights regarding the exploration and use of its uh, marine resources including energy production from water and wind. And we know that uh, there are certain indicators like nautical miles and certain variables like well, which sections, uh, sections of the sea that your boundaries is up to, etc. But uh, we have critical players in, the, in this whole industry. And when it comes to the subject of exclusive economic zones, we have the institutions that are there to ensure we also have the needed manpower to manage affairs as far as uh, this is concerned. And we know that playing critical roles, uh, the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College, as well as other uh, parastatals. And we have officials of the college in the studio today for us to explore what the exclusive economic zone for Ghana is and in the context of West Africa, how can we adequately explore to our benefit some of these zones. And so we have in the studio uh, Commander Dr. Ali Kamaldin. He's a director for research, the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. And thanks for joining me, sir. Thank you very and much. And also Roland. with us is Kennel Michael Amwa AEC. And thanks for joining me, sir. Thank you. Very All much. right. So uh, he is the general coordinator at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. All right. Uh, just very recently, we had the subject of uh, a dispute between Ghana as well as Cote d'Ivoire on maritime boundaries. And, and I know that surely will come up for our discussions. But I have to start with you. Um, commander. When, when it comes to the subject of uh, exclusive economic zones, in what context in our discussion can we place it and what history is there behind all this? Um, thank you very much, Roland. Um, there's actually a very good history behind the exclusive economic zone and um, it's an interesting point that you have actually raised. Um, if you're looking at the history behind the exclusive economy zone, I can tell you certainly that the most important development in the international plane in the last 200 years is perhaps the exclusive economy zone. 200 years? Yes, both in the context of international relations and in the context of international law. So the exclusive economy zone concept is a very, very important and fundamental development. Mm. Okay, so uh, as far as we're concerned, West Africa, when did we become very integral in all this? When did we perhaps even sign up to the conventions and say um, these are boundaries, these are uh, the delineation as far as the econ economic zones are concerned? You want to take yeah, that? Yes, okay. in the context of West Africa, um, let me put it this way, that when we were ushered into independence, one of the critical things that the governments in West Africa and across the third world had to do was to find a footing in maritime affairs. And that footing is what resulted in the exclusive economic zone. So actually, if you are looking at it from the point of view of the 60s and the 70s, the, econo the exclusive economic zone was seen as an impetus to development. Um, you would hear during that time that we had a concept called the New World Economic Order. Uh, within that gamut of the New World Economic Order, one of the fundamental things that was seen as necessary to drive third world countries and especially countries in the third in West Africa mm. was the exclusive economic zone. So it was something that was completely championed by African countries and other developing countries in Latin America, championed consistently for the period of about 10 to 12 years. And finally, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was adopted in 1982 to reflect the demands of these third world countries, most of whom were from our are from uh, uh, mm -hmm. Africa, so this is actually something that is of fundamental importance to Africa, not just because it provides the opportunities, but it but it's because it's something that was actually fought for and brought on the international plane by African countries, most of them, of course, from um, uh, West Africa. Yes. Mm. <laughs> we'll, t we'll talk about that, especially yes. when now that we we have a number of the countries discovering oil, yes. this will be even become more important than than uh, it was even at the time when they were fighting yeah. for it. But we know that the staff college, as we have it, the Ghana Armed Forces um, Command and Staff College, has been playing instrumental roles in in training 
uh, personnel of various armed forces across the sub-region. Yeah. Now, critically, um, taking hindsight, why we have the importance of the exclusive economic zones? How, how, how do you ensure that training, as far as personnel are concerned, is adequately conducted to meet certain criteria uh, in the management of these e exclusive economic zones? Yeah. I would say that um, managing uh, that zone is of vital importance because... To all countries. To least. all countries, especially at countries that have um, maritime boundaries. And uh, for us in the training uh, sphere, we need to build out the capacity of the trainees, that's the officer students, so that when they go out there, they will be able to contribute positively towards policy and uh, management of the zone because uh, we train at the tactical and then the operational level. So these are middle level uh, officers who are going out there to become senior officers who will be contributing to um, the national defense policy of uh, each member state, not only Ghana, but other sister African countries. Mm. In, uh, Af uh, There's an interesting point you make. How has um, the training that you have been undertaking been influenced by perhaps if it's the the disputes that have arisen as, uh, 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 from member countries in the sub-region um, over territorial boundaries as far as the sea is concerned? Well, the For example, we've had the Bakasi Peninsula. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that was on for decades yeah. and like resolved that, only the last few years. Yeah, like the doctor said, um, this training is uh, centered on conventions and international uh, law and others. So. When we get students from all other African countries, all African countries within the, our area or elsewhere, we all have the same type of um, exposure and then information. So when it comes to certain disputes, we are all aware of the conventions. And therefore, it makes it much easier for us to understand how best um, to approach the issue. Because we all know that this is the convention. And therefore, even if there are other parochial interests, still the convention is there, the middle line is there. So it's much more easier for collaboration. That's the essence of the training, mm. especially where we are coming from, different backgrounds. It mm. brings a lot more on the table. Mm. Well, 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 Commander, what difference is there when we're talking about the exclusive economic zones and the issue about the maritime boundaries, et cetera? Um, when you're talking about the exclusive economy zone, you're actually talking about the maritime space that if you were to measure it from the baseline and the baseline is a point from which you start determining your maritime space and so you are talking about from that maritime space up to the outer limit of 200 nautical miles 200 nautical miles may be about um 270 kilometers on land on land there okay. about so you are talking about this in mm. terms of the sea world, you know, looking at it in terms of extending into the sea, mm. you are talking about a zone from the baseline to 200 nautical miles. But answering your question, then within these 200 nautical miles, you will have the territorial sea and you have the exclusive economy zone. The territorial sea will be the 12 nautical mile, and any point then beyond the 12 nautical mile to the 200th nautical mile is the exclusive economy zone. Right. So <coughs> essentially, you are talking about a, a zone in terms of its lateral distance of 188 nautical miles. Mm. Well, what will make it e economic? Uh, um, what is economic <coughs> about uh, a sea boundary that is just uh, uh, that is that is just in front of uh, a, c a country, so to speak? The, the word <laughs> economic was actually one of the compromise that was reached out during the Law of the Sea Conference. In fact, between the period of 1970 or 68 there, about to 1982. And that was a compromise term. But if you are talking about what makes it economic in terms of the sea, I think I can put that into context with three reinforcing statements. One is that nations devolve from the sea, not from land. No matter how you think about it, we have always been made to believe that the land is so important, but the land is certainly not, of, not as important as the sea. So nations devolve from the sea and not from the land. The second statement that I can make is that if you are then not able to control your maritime opportunities, 
then you are bound to be at the lower levels of development, no matter how much you try. And the third, which, which is a build up on that, is that if you look at history, all nations that have risen to greatness, from Carthage through Roman Empire to today, you must be a state that has a coast. So if you are very lucky to have a coast, then you have all the potential to achieve greatness. Mm. And that greatness that you can be able to get from the maritime domain is far in excess of what you can get from land mm. in terms of the economic and the socio-economic impact of that potential is far greater than land. Mm. So the word economic perhaps emphasizes this aspect of it. But again, it is just not a zone that you have only economic interest. Economic interest is just a layer of the multiplicity of interest or opportunities that there is at the maritime space. You, you raising the issue of Carthage and etc. Yeah. Uh, brings into mind Greece, the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all talks about conquest. And it means that you have to conquer, that is, in those uh, pre asian times in many respects. Yeah, they but talked about conquest, but essential also was about maritime trade. Sure. And the ability to sure. harvest your maritime mm. opportunities. Mm. Yeah. That you come, you have to conquer them. Mm. So just like the Europeans went to the Americas and did the conquering. Yeah. Initially, it was the Dutch in many respects. But, yeah. uh, but uh, as far as in this modern day is concerned, uh, with all the pr problems that we've been having with maritime disputes, etc., um, how has your training been shaped in such a way that perhaps uh, personnel are very much aware about current trends? Yeah, um, it all boils down to the conventions and then the international law um, stipulates what is stipulates in terms of measuring or uh, determining the maritime boundaries between states. And so, as we concentrate on some of these things, our students are made aware that these are the conventions that guide how to determine various uh, boundaries, and therefore. Um, various scenarios are studied, various um, issues are studied that have risen out of disputes and other things. And therefore, by training on such issues and then um, analyzing such uh, previous uh, situations, it gives them a broader view of how to determine in their own context how it should be done. And therefore, when they are faced with such problems, mm. originally they know how to um, handle it mm. and therefore be able to contribute positively towards uh, the national outlook because mm. they will become the staff officers who will be providing information for the decision makers and therefore if they are much aware and much exposed in that sphere they will be able to contribute positively mm. towards a uh, positive de decision. Co oh, Commander Kamal, you, you were nodding. You wanted to add something to it? Yes, I wanted to add something to what Kennel is saying and essentially also to emphasize the fact that um, for even for the normal staff college, the commanding staff course, it is just not military personnel that are on the course. Um, as he mentioned earlier, the institution is an institution of excellence. So we have three, 11 different countries, countries that yeah. are currently on the staff course. And when I'm talking about 11 different countries, just not countries in the sub-region, but you are talking of even Tanzania, yeah. uh, Zambia, Zambia, yeah. Africa, Zambia, and other countries yeah. that are on Central the staff Africa. course, Rwanda that are on the course. And in terms of domestic, that looking at Ghana, it's just not military personnel that are also on the course. We have uh, officials from, say, Narcotics Control Board who are on the staff course for one year, from the fire service, yeah, fire from service. Um, uh, prisons, from police. And for the EZ course itself, it is even much expanded. expanded. You have participation from various MDAs and parastatals, from um, EPA, from Shippers Council, from fisheries, from ports and harbors. So you are building the critical mass of people that should be able to have the knowledge to be able to perform and protect the maritime environment. Yeah. That is what these, that is. these trainings that you undertake, mm -hmm. what, why have they become more crucial in the current present day and age? If I can use that phrase as yeah. a cliche. Yeah, it has become crucial because, you know, um, no agency or no department can do it all alone. Mm. There should be collaboration. Okay. And so our college has become a center for interdepartmental training. So you see people from all the MMDs, as he said, and then from other security agencies coming together. And from other to countries train. as well. And from, from other countries. And, and from those countries, so you have civil servants? Exactly. Some, okay. some do come. Mm -hmm. And uh, even last year, the last course, people came from Nigeria and others mm -hmm. to join the EEZ course. I mean, the, what we're having 
uh, this week. And so by so doing, we build the capacity for the national effort. I mean, we all come on board and we have the same uh, platform where we can share ideas and then uh, assimilate uh, other knowledge and therefore uh, prepare ourselves to be able to perform functionally in our various duties. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a, a very good thing. Yeah, in in shaping course curricula, Commander Kamal D, uh, what do you take into cognizance? You take into cognizance the importance of the EUZ, and I can perhaps summarize that in four or five critical areas. You're looking at resource protection. You're looking at um, conservation and management of the marine environment. You are looking at transnational crime, I see. Then you are looking at um, um, uh, protection of shipping. So these four critical areas is what shape the course curricula. So you have to be able to develop the program within this one week to cover all these areas. And um, each is very important and they are very much interrelated. And when we are talking about resource protection, you are talking about both living and non-living resources. When I'm talking about the course content dealing with transnational crime, you are talking about piracy, but you are talking also about, importantly, things like um, IUU fishing, that is um, unlawful, unregulated, unreported fishing, so illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. But you are also talking about narcotics transshipment at sea. So this is the component that will deal with transnational crime. Then you are talking about shipping administration, both at sea and at port. So there you are talking about the interface or the whole spectrum from sea to the port. And for that matter, you are also talking about port administration. And finally, as I said, you are talking about conservation and management of the marine environment. So you are talking about fisheries protection, but you are also essentially talking about marine pollution and mm. biodiversity. <laughs> it's, an it's a broad spectrum yeah. Yeah. So of, you see that of, of subsectoral subjects exactly. that you deal with. Yeah. So you see that all players are brought mm. on board. It's very interesting, though. I would have wished to be part of the court. Perhaps I can uh, do my connection after. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but more seriously, um, I, I was just reading yesterday that over the last two years or so, we've recorded, um, as far as in the high seas, um, the current um, illegal seizure of ships and, and, and other crimes. And, and what do you call it? Piracy. Okay, piracy in the excess of over 20, just along the coast of West Africa and Central Africa. And we have a, a lot more numbers around the Horn of Africa. Uh, how does that, these modern day crimes, how, how do they tend to also influence the, the sort of inputs that you make in your curriculum? Yeah, um, fighting crime of uh, that magnitude and nature is, I would say, beyond the capacity of individual states within the so region and within the African region. It's a stakeholder collaboration. Exactly. So there should be a lot of collaboration. And in doing so, um, we also have to uh, take inputs from other developed nations and other well-endowed um, um, nations and then uh, uh, militaries or navies. And so when we bring such people in as resource persons, they are able to share with us their experiences and then even give us current um, strategies that are being used in more developed areas to fight. Like if you have, if you go to the uh, East Africa, the Horn of Africa, you have the EU states, even NATO states collaborating to fight piracy there. And we are also doing the same in our sub region here. Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, and others are also coming together to uh, fight piracy. You heard, I um, think, last two weeks what our Navy did. So by so doing, we share yeah. ideas and get. Um, strategies from them and the I saw you pointing at him. He was on the sea too? Oh no 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's a, a, a lecturer. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. He's an academic. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> but, but but if we take all these into into perhaps a more broad spectrum of our thinking, how do these crimes that we tend to be reporting tend to also um, influence but also affect inhibit in many instances the subjects of the exclusive economic zones oh in many ways um uh, if you're perhaps talking about threat, yeah if you're talking about crimes at sea and uh, perhaps i can just uh, zero on piracy because you mentioned that in particular that affects um many of the interests that we are dealing with that i just outlined first of all there is a relationship between piracy and your resource interest um piracy actually refers to hijacking uh, of ships. 
but it can also be in the context of trade to offshore installations. So whether you are fishing vessels, and you, re you remember that the vessel that was um, uh, hijacked in the last two weeks was actually in the last week or the week after last week was a fishing vessel, for instance. So piracy can impact on your fisheries interest significantly and also can impact on your offshore installations because it's, it's one crime that is overlaid on the other. And you can see in the case of Nigeria, for instance, um, uh, attacks at sea has significantly affected their oil potential and their ability to produce. So in the same way, piracy and maritime crimes can also relate to your marine pollution interest and your conservation interest. One of the things that we, 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 we miss out in discussing at a national level is that our, our crisis in this, oil, in this whole energy thing, if you remember, started with this West African gas pipeline issue. And the West African gas pipeline problem came because of piracy. It was a piracy incident that resulted in a damage to the West African gas pipeline. And consequently, we in Ghana and other people in the sub-region, that is Togo and Benin, suffered so much because we couldn't have transmission of gas. And even up to today, perhaps the integrity of the gas pipeline is still not as we, we would want it. So piracy and maritime crime generally can impact on a spectrum of your maritime interest. And such a training, as Kennel mentioned, is, is supposed to bring synergy and bring people together to be able to handle that. Because to be able to control your, your maritime uh, interest, you need three critical things. You need um, the, 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 the capacity, that is manpower, which this training will bring. You need policy shaping and, le and legal framework, and you need presence. And this will deal with that also. Presence is like the Navy, for instance, being there at sea and m maintaining and ensuring that there is order at sea and that our maritime interest is protected, which is what the Navy has been doing a fine job for a very long time. And then you also need the stakeholders to have that capability and capacity, which is what this course will bring on board. And finally, you need policy shaping. And these are middle level officers rising up to very the management positions in wherever they are, and they'll contribute to policy shaping and policy direction in future. So these three critical areas are very important. And if we look at the output, or if we want the outcomes of this course, it's intended to be able to shape all these three areas. Mm. Mm. Uh, transferring knowledge is important, and uh, even, even for the normal military, you have exactly. to go to perhaps uh, Fort Knox somewhere in, in the US and, and, and various bases yeah. in the UK, etc., to get training. The Royal Naval College, for example, in the UK is one of the foremost training for the Navy, yeah. especially in Africa or West Africa. Well, uh, how do you make sure that when you do all, the, all, all, all these training regimes that you undertake, uh, you tend to, as a college, track the performance of the students or, or, or the produce from your institutions and make sure that perhaps yeah. they are influencing other policy decisions or normal daily administrative procedures in their countries. Yeah, yeah we do. Because um, when you are going on a course outside, you are briefed about the course generally and you are able to prepare adequately. And then when you come back, you are debriefed so that we see how much you have benefited and how much change you have accumulated. And also, not only to get the knowledge for yourself, but also to bring in something that can be used to also review or upgrade our uh, stack of, uh, I would say, material that we have back, back home. Mm. So that we can- Especially in Africa where bureaucracy and, and, and the top top-notch politically don't, don't, don't want to take any advice from any individual or body politic? Um, uh, not that per se, but then, um, you see, knowledge is, I would say, dynamic. Day in, day out, things, new things uh, come up, and then we need to also upgrade so that we, can stagnate, uh, we don't stagnate. So by doing so, we, uh, we get information here and there from where our people are going to train, mm. and then uh, we try to use the knowledge they have accumulated and the material that they brought back to upgrade ourselves mm. and so enrich our own programs mm. so that at least we can be abreast of uh, what is going on internationally. Mm. Now the world is in a global economy and uh, we, uh, we are moving very fast okay. so we can't afford to... Um, <laughs> My next question, I don't know whether it's a very diplomatic question or not, mm -hmm. but you, you have all this call, all this being done at the college, lots of training. 
uh, imparting a lot of knowledge. But we still have dispute with Ivory Coast over maritime boundary. If we do a lot more training, there should have been a lot more synergy and collaboration. And even peaceful coexistence should have been at the bane of all the things that we do. You mean between the countries? Sure. Yeah, and that is why what we are having now is peaceful, isn't it? Yeah. It's peaceful well, because... Well, it has been peaceful in the past. Yes, it's peaceful also still because um, what the states have done is to tend to the framework that is in place, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the dispute settlement mechanism that is inbuilt in the, in the framework to use it to resolve the dispute. Um, essentially, it's like you are reverting to a third party in a very peaceful mode and asking the third party that this is my case, this is his case, so please listen to our respective case and resolve this for us. And to the extent that the states are before the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, it still shows that the states are actually collaborating in trying to find a way forward. Because at the end of the day, boundaries must be delimited. And unless the states have a unanimous agreement as to how the boundaries should be delimited, then they must tend to a third party. And essentially, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the jurisprudence that has accumulated international law has provided a way that this should be done. And that is why the parties have taken it to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm. Actually, within the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, but what we are doing now is, an, is a special chamber, or if, if I would call it an arbitral chamber of the Law of the Sea framework, the Law of the Sea Tribunal framework, a special chamber that has been agreed by the parties to settle this dispute mm. in, the, in the case of Ghana and Kodiko. So that's what we've reached? Uh, well, that we're is, not, we're that now is, selecting members of the chamber? No, I think they've actually gone beyond that. Selected members of the chamber already, the, the chair of the, uh, the president of the tribunal has been selected and the parties perhaps are now filing their respective submissions uh, before the court. Mm. But uh, how does this then, okay, you wanted to yeah, add? Yeah, let me add it. Just as we were saying earlier on, mm. we're talking about collaboration and training. <laughs> together. So, uh, it will interest you that we have uh, two Ivorians yeah, on, the, two on this course. On this very course? Yeah. For the next one week? Or no, no, no they, are, they, are, they, are, they are part of the training since okay. uh, August. Okay, and since they're August. going to take part in this EEZ uh, uh, module. Mm -hmm. And so, like you say, in all the conventions and other uh, procedures, they will be aware of. And therefore, uh, it's, it's much easier collaborating to resolve that, that dispute. Mm -hmm. Since we have joint training together, we understand issues the same way. So, I mean, uh, resolving disputes amongst us shouldn't be that much difficult. That is barring all other influences. Mm. Well, can I say more? I'll say better said than done. Mm. But I in many respects, how, how do you then have to fuse these practical, perhaps, disagreements and challenges that we experience with um, the training regimes? The practical experience. Yeah, the pra practical experiences in, of uh, in, in having these disputes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the training regimes you have. For example, when you're doing the interpretation of the conventions, etc., to your students. Yes, it's, it happens. As Kendall mentioned, as part of the training, of course, this is a training institution. We definitely cannot resolve all issues, you know, between states. But as part of the training, you have scenarios, you know, and the scenario will will actually involve things like maritime boundaries, for instance. How do you, you know, what, what would be the various interpretations? Uh, where will be the points of disagreement? And let's be honest, uh, for every international framework that is in place, it is made up of words, and words are susceptible to different interpretations. Exactly. So it will, it will mean that um, during this training, the practical experience that you will have from people, people from country A and country B is that these particular phrases in the convention are susceptible to different interpretations. So you may have a different interpretation, other person will have a different interpretation, but you get the practical insight into that. And you know that at the end of the day, when a third party, a third party may then have to resolve the interpretation in one way or the other. But you know something that is practical, it's something that is not based on somebody's imagination, is because realistically the framework can be interpreted in one, two, or three ways. And that is always the case in international law and with all international instruments anyway, because it has to do with building consensus. And these things perhaps are not things that happen after. Even in the process of negotiating the international instrument, you would have realized if you went through the, the preparatory document that even from the beginning, people would have had different understanding and interpretations of the various provisions and phrases in the convention. Mm. Yes. No. Yeah. If I may add, during as part of the the, the module, um, the participants are made to study past events. I mean, various disputes that has happened and have been resolved. 
So going through the analysis and then they're studying them and presenting on such issues, they also draw their own uh, an analysis of how the issue was resolved. And by so doing, they sort of tend to dissect the pros and cons of whatever convention and the interpretation that individuals gave to that convention. So it enhances our capacity to um, understand some of these uh, dicey issues with the interpretation of uh, uh, such conventions and therefore assist in... Uh, 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 according to the UN Special Commission on Narcotics, uh, almost close to a decade now, the West African sub-region has become a hub for transporting illegally narcotics from Latin America uh, through to Europe or the US, or the Americas, so to speak. Uh, how do you factor all this in um, when you're raising your issues with your students as a college? You, want, you wanted to answer that? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I can say. Yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, transnational crime, maritime transnational crime is one of the fundamental things that you deal with. So in such a course, of course, we all speak about these things in the media, but in such a course, students and participants are made aware of the reality of it, the statistics, the, the dynamics of the crime, the actors, what is involved, how the crime itself has shaped from, has changed from time to time. Because mm. when we are talking about narcotics transmission, uh, transshipment at sea, it is not something that has been status, uh, static. Those operators have changed their modes of operating, you know, from one mode to the other adopting to the different uh, challenges or the different responses that are coming from the security agencies. So such knowledge is shared with the participants. But it is also important that they know the legal instruments that are available in tackling such a response. Because narcotics is one of the difficult things to deal with, especially when it comes to trying to combat it at sea. But they are made aware of the framework, the legal framework that is in place, the permissive, how the rise and the limits of that legal framework. But more importantly also, they are also even aware of operationally how to combat uh, narcotics. I yeah. see. And uh, like you said, rightly said, fighting such crime uh, is, is, is not a one person show. We need a lot more collaboration, and especially in the field of intelligence. Because uh, what I would say basically we do is, has been always reactive to what the uh, traffickers do. Is they move and then you move in. But then if you're able to move a step further, to be proactive, to be able to find out their intentions and then map out strategies to deal and then thwart their efforts in the bad, I mean their efforts in the bad, it will rather uh, uh, be an advantage to us. And therefore, not only do we train, but also network among ourselves. As we said, we have a lot more people come from outside Ghana and then within Ghana, so many departments, so like Narcotic Control Board. So we are sharing ideas as to how they go about their duties and some of their operations vis-a-vis -vis what we also do. So together we build a formidable team that will be able to handle such situations. And by getting other information or other collaborators from outside, it helps us to build a better capacity to handle such things. Mm. Because, uh, <laughs> Interesting. Well, you do all this. So we have, uh, what do you call it, transshipment? Loads yeah. of yeah. Um, yeah. illegal... Don't, don't, don't forget that such uh, bureaus or drug traffickers are equally trained and also benefiting from uh, the, the, I mean the, the latest was, technology. Yeah, the latest technology. No. And they have, I would say they are very smart people. You know, mm. you can get... That's a good excuse test. for you. Oh, yeah, a, a bit. Yeah, 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 a bit. So, but, so, uh, so they but, evade. But emphasizing on what he said, even between the route from, um, from uh, Latin America to America, there's still transshipment taking place. So, so even the yeah. almighty there America, huge yeah. tunnels like huge seas. tunnels, <laughs> exactly. and, and <laughs> drug traffickers have even been able to do it mm. using submarines. Mm. You yes. know, so so mm. that is how sophisticated mm. it is. So it is a crime that keeps changing in its face, mm. and nations and regions will have to also develop the necessary frameworks and mm. capacity to be able to handle okay. that. I was just reading from The Economist magazine, I think I believe on Friday, mm. that the U.S. government over the last decade ha spends annually 40 to 50 billion U.S. dollars fighting narcotics yeah. around the world, yeah. but especially between it and Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, including the wars that he always fights in yeah. Mexico, yeah. Colombia. It's still going on. <laughs> yes, it still goes on, mm -hmm. because it's that's the base of, of the narcotics trade. Mm -hmm. but, but now, if we have to streamline perhaps uh, what happens as far as um, for our exclusive uh, economic zones in the sub-region, what is the foremost important thing that always comes to mind for governments in the sub-region 
all the rest of Africa, all the people, all the all the personnel that you train, and their government, and also for you as military or or naval people, what in terms of what needs to be done adequately to get them well equipped and and, and make sure the the, the right ideas are sent out there to get them working. Yeah, I would say um, the right thing, or the most thing that we think of is um, how to protect our zones in terms of as part of the management of the whole zone. And uh, to be able to protect, you need the various platforms, you need the, the knowledge, I mean the capacity, and you need how, I mean the training to be able to operate those platforms. Say, so, uh, for example, the Navy, they should be able to understand what the whole issue is about so that they'll be able to map out their strategy and their training to be able to use their platforms to manage the zone well in terms of providing security like preventing pirates from operating protecting our, 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 our fisheries and then ensuring that the methods that are approved have been used you will see that occasionally our navy go out there and then they arrest those uh, fishermen using illegal methods this is our part of managing the, the, the resources that we have in the sea but then we give our quota why is other areas also give their quotas and so together we uh, manage the thing well i mean the the, the zone well yeah. so, so taking it from the presence point of view because i outlined three thematic um, responses that you must have which is presence policy framework policy and legal framework and then um, human ca capacity so the presence is what your question is bordering on, and that is what Kendall has been emphasizing. The presence is where the ability of the Navy to deploy, to be able to detect, know what is happening, and then be able to arrest you know, what is happening or prevent the thing from happening. And the Navy will do that in, in many areas, resource protection, preventing crime, and um, also managing and ensuring that there is law and order at sea. And that is why the Navy is very important in this context. Of course, it's not just the Navy. The Navy will do this with other stakeholders. Essentially, from the Ghana Armed Forces point of view, it is the larger Ghana Armed Forces that is involved. But the Navy and the Air Force will play such a lead role in protecting our exclusive economy. So that presence is important. And platforms are essential. Platforms both at sea and on land, because you have to integrate the two to be able to protect your maritime interests. And in the case of the Navy, um, we, ha we do have platforms, but it is also a fact that for us to be able to adequately protect our maritime environment, we are even less than average in terms of the platforms that we have. Of course, we are not the only country that is less than average because these platforms are very expensive. Many countries will be less than average, you know, especially in By our sub-region. By platform, I mean ships, platforms at sea, but you're also looking at surveillance. Uh, because uh, I was just yes. about to ask that, yes. see, in, in, in this part of our world yes. where the economic indices just don't add up because yes. the variables of the economy uh, are not too well at mm. the close of the financial year, yeah. um, perhaps even budget for defense, etc., is inadequate. Yes. So, uh, are these not weaknesses? And yeah, how that do you is it. Yes, how do you yes. and that is these? where it's, you always don't know, you know, whether you, what to put before the other. Because <laughs> essentially, as I mentioned to you, the sea is of such importance that if we could harness or even be able to take our maritime opportunities, then even the cost of those platforms will be an insignificant part of the returns that we get from managing our maritime interests. Very insignificant part. But again, you need the platforms to be able to guarantee even that maritime interest. So you don't always know where to invest in, where to start from. Do you invest on the platforms, you know, to be able to get a greater interest at, you know, in future? So this is where the challenge is. But you certainly need such platform because there, there, there's so much at stake at sea that you need these platforms. If you look at it just even from the point of view of fisheries, there's so much at sea as many states are making billions of dollars annual from their fisheries. We do also make some, some, some returns on our fisheries, but we will have to do more to protect our fisheries so that we can get their returns. And mm. if we look at it from just even the point of view that even as a maritime nation, we still import fish. If we look at the, the nets of our export of fish and our import of fish, there's a deficit in, in terms of our import. Even yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you realize I mean, that not, that, that <laughs> margin, yes. It's something that is of importance to us. I think maybe um, if I looked at the figures of 2010, there about, you know, we perhaps 
imported fish up to uh, about $300 million in terms of the, the balance of our export and import. So our ability to protect our resources means that we are actually saving this for other things. But apart from saving it, as I said, we can even positively generate a lot of benefit from our maritime mm. domain. So, so economic interests are also critical very as critical. far as trying to harness what exactly. the resources are yeah. as far as the zones are concerned. Okay. Let me just add that uh, the platform that we're talking about, not only naval platform, but sure. also air platforms sure. are very cardinal. Sure. Because um, looking at the distance at which they mm. must cover, it's, it's very vital that yeah, they Because talking about 270 kilometers. Yeah. kilometers. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like yeah. from here, you drive through Cape Coast, Takrade, mm. yeah. then you almost get to Axe. Yes. That's long. So it's, it's quite a distance. So we need the Air Force. They are very key in uh, assisting the Navy to manage the zone, I mean, providing security. With your interaction with your students, uh, Kenel Aisiamwa, yeah. do you think there's always and always will be um, this very nuance or, or perhaps uh, this very struggle uh, in their respective countries between where the priority should lie, whether, well, economically we think we should build more social infrastructural projects than uh, perhaps equip the white armed forces to, 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 to do what they're supposed to do, etc., in respect of this. Yeah, it has always been there. You see, there's always the push and pull of which should be uh, a priority providing security or providing other social amenities and others everybody has his own understanding of this issue but uh, as you are aware or as you maybe you may accept um security is vital for development to take place so if there's no stability uh, i mean i don't see any country making any impact if there's no stability. but then the stability or peace will not come on a silver platter. You need to uh, invest. And who provide the security? It's the security forces, the police, the army, and the paramilitary and other uh, entities. And therefore, funding them or giving them the uh, implements to work and to provide special intelligence, which is very key for the survival of every state and then the, the effectiveness of every security organization. If you don't have enough intelligence about what is happening around you, even within your country, especially with the crime and others, you should be able to be a step ahead of, let's say, armed robbers. If you can uh, have a network of the phones that they use, I mean, they, they are numbers, and then be able to listen in, you will be able to have a network of who they are dealing with and their movements, and so be a bit proactive. But doing these things is very costly in terms of getting legal instruments to back such approaches, getting money, getting the infrastructure to be able to, be able to listen into known criminals and their, their, their phone calls. And do, it's all a lot of money. Even having the vehicles go on patrols, having the weapons, having the training, it's a lot of cost. But which one comes? Commander Kamal Dean, mm -hmm. that means you're training in futility. Oh, yes, it's of great utility. Um, not just no, I mean, you're, you're training in futility because. Uh, oh, no, no, we are no. not. No, no, no. I think <laughs> no. you rather tend the word and call it utility. <laughs> we are training for utility. Yes, oh, okay. yes not futility. Mm. futility. So yeah. you are rather you training for utility. Yes, that's not exactly. my question. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 yeah, so, uh, of course, there is some platforms for each country to mm. operate with. In our context as a country, we do have some platforms, but critically we need to, to expand that mm. to be able to, to, to get the returns that we need. Mm. Um, uh, just to add up to the question that uh, uh, the discretion of our maritime space in a physical sense because people who are not uh, mariners, they, they want to be able to relate in a physical sense. When you are talking about maritime space, our maritime space as a country is about 70% of our land. It's about 70% of our land. So our maritime space is about 70% of our land. So you can see how huge it is. And that is why essentially, even if you pick our constitution, the very beginning of our constitution, somewhere in Article 4.2 or 4.3, it is stated clearly that Ghana comprise of our 10 regions, our territorial sea, and the, the next paragraph that followed also said that our interest also lies in the exclusive economy zone. So even constitutionally, it is clear that as a country that we must begin to think about our interests just not on, on land mm. but that essentially our interest on a, a significant component of our interest lies at sea and mm. this in a physical sense is about 70% of our land size so you are talking about 70% of our land size 
and you are then looking at the resources that are available to protect that 70 percent of our land size and let me put it in the context for instance if we talk about the navy for instance you are talking about giving police just about 10 cars to protect um, from here to kumasi so you are talking about 70 percent of our land size and we are having a few platforms maybe 10 20 to protect that 70 percent of our land size so that is how enormous the tax is for an institution like the navy mm. and that is why this training is also critical because you are trying to then be able to use this few within their mdas and their mdas to be able to protect this uh, uh, vital maritime interest and maritime space mm. i have to go back in history because the napoleon wars were fought using the sea basically uh, king louis may not have done enough for france but then established france as a critical player in the uh, in the times as far as the geoeconomic political period uh, we fought over the period also a number of interventions that have been made whether it's by the crusades etc all using the sea crucial now, currently, if you put all that in context, would you say um, the sea is as vital as it is for, for countries in conquering or perhaps also uh, taking over various economic interests, not only in respective countries, but uh, in the way they explore their marine interests uh, to meet their socioeconomic growth? I don't know whether my question is too uh, academic or too yeah, political. I I may take it for you. Okay, please. Yes, I may you. take it for you. And it's interesting <laughs> that, Roland, you, you have uh, mentioned the Napoleon Wars and France, and then you are then talking about how important the maritime space is. And if we also go back to history, you will know that, that one of the reasons why actually there was a limit to which Napoleon would ever conquer the sure, world sure. was because France was a limited maritime nation. Sure. France was not able to harness its maritime potential as much as its competitors. And the like competitor Portugal, in this case was Spain. Portugal and Britain in particular. Mm, mm. So Britain was a maritime nation mm. and being a maritime nation, it used its maritime opportunities and resources to support its war effort. So that is in history and that will always remain. So in the modern world, it's almost the same that each country's growth must be underpinned by its maritime resources. Unless you can underpin your development with your maritime resources, there's always a limit to which you will go to. And if you are lucky to be a coastal state, then you must look at, at every point in time as harnessing this maritime potential to be able to push you. That is the push. Well, as, as we wind up our discussions, um, you, yes, do you think that as a country, and as countries in the sub-region, mm -hmm. we're really harnessing uh, exclusive economic zones? Yeah, this is where the problem is. We have not been able to fully uh, exploit the resources that we have there. And, and in the same way, we are not be able to protect such resources adequately. And that is where uh, we continue to look out for better methods and then uh, efforts to uh, get such things well protected. Because if you look, if you hear in the news uh, a lot of Strange vessels coming to fish without uh, licenses, pirates operating, uh, hindering trade along the coast. Also, the danger they pose to our oil uh, infrastructure, that's bunkering and others that will affect the trade in terms of oil. So, we have a lot to protect and we have a lot to lose if we don't do the right thing. Mm. So, it is, it is quite critical that uh, we continue to make efforts to be able to protect our and manage our resources mm. that we have in the sea and therefore uh, this course is in the right direction mm. in building the capacity and the college uh, you, you've been there for how many years now uh, very um not too long um of course i double in the college but not necessarily that, you that, i mean the yes, college the col oh the college has been there for, been for, there for, very, for decades for very long yes. for decades yes, yes. and um uh, Ken Amo has been there much longer but as we, we said in the intro, the college is supposed to train staff. That was a command and staff course. So command and staff course, I think there are two important things there. You can substitute the staff with administration, people for higher level administration, and the command you can replace that with leadership. So you are talking about leadership and administration training at that level. And as a college, we have been in existence for a long time 
and it's an institution of excellence. And apart from the command and staff course, the college also offers a master's program on defense and international yes, politics. Yes. Mm. yes, international defense. Those who know the college will know that for, for, dec for, for over a decade, we were actually having affiliated master's programs that we were running, two programs. One was a master's in international relations, which, is, which was with affiliation with uh, Les Yet, that's the Legon Center for International um, uh, Affairs and Diplomacy. And then subsequently to that, there was um, a program on leadership and governance yeah. Yeah. with JIMPA, a master's program with leadership and governance with JIMPA. And now the college is accredited as a full university and the college is running um, a master's program and that master's is in defense and international politics, which is being run in the college, just not for the students, but for the general public. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So that's what it's ongoing. Yeah, it's ongoing. And, and so basically, is that what you do? You just run programs and, and yeah, train? Yeah, run both military and academic programs. Okay. And uh, we train the general public as well as the uh, militaries of Ghana and then uh, African mm. uh, countries. So you advertise for yeah, we advertise. students? Students are starting 26 February as the general public. That's the weekend classes. They start in 26. Is there a year's program? Yeah, one year. One year. So year. This is, um, in two semesters? In two modules? Semesters. Yeah. Okay. Modules. And some of the... Uh, some of the some of the courses you run are... Oh, in that master's program, we have um, conflict, defense, international law, international relations, international diplomacy, international institutions. Um, it cuts across, you know. So these are the courses. So essentially, it's a juncture between security studies and international relations. Yeah. And it is a, it's a very well-packaged program. Mm -hmm. And we do have um, a very uh, formidable team of lecturers and management, you know, Wow. Uh, professors and people that yeah. take that's interesting mm -hmm. uh, how do you make sure that then you bring your services closer to the public a lot more yeah as i said it's open to the general public okay this uh, master's program yeah. is not only i know to i know i mean yeah. your interaction between the college and then the public how, yeah. how? and then uh, we, we just like what we are doing now we okay. try to reach out to the public for just them part to of the efforts yeah yeah we are not just a military institution but then it's a training center which is open to uh, all and sundry to build a capacity of the nation and therefore everybody's welcome we are in the process of ruling out distant learning programs and then other short courses certificated courses in, in security and other areas which will benefit uh, both lower and middle level management as well as uh, in africa or ghana when they say we're in the process it means that it's a, a process of almost a decade Oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't happen in the context okay. of the military, the military, not in the context of the So when is that? Give us time. Like yes. so. When do you hope to roll out your online courses so that we can also be part, so oh. if we can be in the classroom all the oh, time? Yeah. Yeah. By, by, by next academic year, yeah. 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 should be out. Yeah. By next August. academic year. Yes. Yes. Okay. Should, should start with the from online. August. From the online, yeah. Or long distance, you call yes. it. long distance. And this is So I can be working and be doing that. Oh, doing it. No problem. Aside that we even have the weekend and the afternoon program. No, I can come for weekend and afternoon. Okay. And in the future, you are looking at even courses like um, um, lo uh, logistics, you know, yeah. yeah, program in logistics, a program in leadership. So all these are becoming part of the college. Right. And the college has always been very open, um, especially if you talk to those yeah. that we have been dealing with, yeah. So when and, they, when and you it's, become it's a listed um, public university, mm -hmm. uh, like according to the sure. National Education Board. We need a lot more yeah. of some colleges, and I think that with expertise uh, coming from the military, uh, th that will also um, augur well. The current um, program you're running has been from uh, from August, is that it? Yeah, the and will be ending. Course, will be ending in. A July? Uh, no, August this year. August this year. So yeah. it's a one year so it's a program. One year. program and program. you say you're having participation from various countries. Various in countries, yeah, 11 countries. 11 mm. countries. Is it expensive? The staff course itself? Uh, yeah. It the is academic is course. <laughs> the academic course, um, yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's a moderate. It's uh, moderate, uh, yes. Uh, comparable to the other comparable ones. Yes. Other yes. Other Just one. the same. Yeah. Yes, it's comparable to gym mm. and some yeah, other. No, yes, yeah, right. Because it's you give quality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, don't worry. I'm only trying to <laughs> add value to yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, for you. Yeah. Okay, we'll search out you. The marketing department will search out you. So <laughs> okay. you can pay. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be it. But, yeah. but but it's been interesting having a lot more chats with you mm -hmm. on this very subject. Yeah. But um, uh, we're hoping that we can have a lot more discussions on the exclusive economic zones. Yeah. But more importantly, also in terms of the knowledge that you are sharing um, for. 
personnel and other people within the sub-region and the rest of Africa. And thanks for joining me this morning. And I've had in the studio Commander Dr. Ali Kamal Deen. He's the Director for Research, the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Thanks for joining yeah, me, thank sir. Thank you very much. And also well. Colonel Michael uh, Eisiamwa is the General Coordinator for the college as the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Thanks also. Thank you. Very okay, you all have a good morning. Thank you. And thanks also for joining us. And, and I know that you've enjoyed the discussions, but uh, please always make sure you get interactive on our page on Facebook, join us on TV, and also a handle we have on Twitter, join us on TV. Just in case you were not able to join us for the full length of the interviews or the regular programming we have on the channel, always make sure you join. Uh, channel on YouTube because we have uploaded hundreds of videos there and the channel on YouTube is my joy online and so when you get to uh, YouTube please just type my joy online and you get that that very channel and please you can also type within the bar any of them whether it's my banner or any of the subject or look at the videos that are up there and try to click on any of them and just watch for your own exclusivity in the meantime though we're taking a break when we come back we'll have a lot more for you